This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to bigheadsmedia.com for more great podcasts. Bonjour mes amis et bienvenue à la cuisine de la désolation. Voici épisode 29. Je m'appelle Christophe et avec moi, comme toujours, est ma cohorte indéfensable, un homme qui comprend la différence entre une bête noire et une bite noire, c'est Chris. Bonjour. Ça va, Chris? Ça va bien. Merci. Et toi? Pas mal, merci. Je prends mes pantoufles de podcasting, comme toujours. Euh, pompomus. D'accord. <rire> ah bien sûr. Et tous les mots comme ça. Euh... <rire> D'accord, c'est épisode 29. On doit parler le français pour épisode 29. Ok, fine. <laughs> we'll do it in English. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 29 of Cooking with Grief, the comedy podcast that gently cups you and asks you to cough. I'm Chris, and I'm not medically qualified to do that. As ever, I'm joined by my azagously livid co-host, Chris. Hi. Hi. Bonjour. Bonjour. I think we've covered the small talk in our limited French. <laughs> I wonder how many people are going to listen past the French bit. <laughs> yeah, it's going to go, bonjour, off, not for me, thank you. <laughs> yeah, apart from maybe a couple of French people who are like, ah, oh, <laughs> Finalement. <laughs> <laughs> Some content uh, I can get the... behind. Yeah, and then, uh, uh disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> You know, for you two French listeners. <laughs> we disappointed everyone who doesn't speak French. And then disappointed everyone who does. Well, you know, we're, we're a omnilingual disappointment policy. Just across the board. Yeah, You know, true. we're sorry. <laughs> so here's how the podcast works. Each of us two Chris's bring two topics that have tickled our respective fancies during the week to discuss. And t'other Chris has no idea what they'll be asked to talk about. In the past, we've covered topics as diverse as the average weight of a regret, whether the moon likes crosswords, and how to make your very own platypus. So without confusing and slightly infuriating intro out of the way, Chris, what's your first topic to entertain our listeners and silence our enemies? Okay, Chris, so here's a question. What do you think the hardest party an animal in the world is? The elephant. A uh, strong answer. Actually, I think elephants have been known to get drunk. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Don't they... They know to eat rotten, f like, yeah. rotten fruit. Yeah. We may have covered this on a previous episode. Maybe you told me, and that's how I know it. Well, the answer is, in fact, shrimp from Suffolk. <laughs> that's so specific. <laughs> All the shrimp tested in the rural UK county of Suffolk were found to have cocaine in them, <laughs> and also quite a lot of ketamine. Right, okay, were they bankers in the 80s? <laughs> Apparently so. I mean, I like to assume, like you, that they're either bankers in the 80s or, you know, just living the good life. It's most likely because yeah. people are flushing it down the toilet or whatever, and it's all got into the water stream, but it's got into it in levels that they had no idea it was going to be this high. So it says more about the people of Suffolk? Yes. Very dull county. You'd think so. Got to spice it up somehow. Yeah, exactly. And obviously you'd expect it in places like London or, you know, other big cities. I mean, just imagine what's happening to the fish around, like, in the canals in Amsterdam. Blazed out the mines. Yeah. I wonder if it, like, and it also doesn't say whether or not the shrimp have been affected. Like, do these shrimps move really fast? Do they have predilection for uh, EDM and stuff? Or... <laughs> are they, are they r rubbing the gums and having generally tedious but quick conversations? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do they even have gums? I don't think so, you know. Probably not. I don't think. Do they even have mouths? They must do. Is it specifically shrimp that are affected, or did they also test other um, I think they only like, looked aquatic at, creatures? I think they only looked at shrimp. So really, we have, based on this article anyway, um, it could just be the shrimp particularly love it. Like, the fish might be all like, yeah, it's not for me. Like, I did that once, and it just... Yeah, the straight-edged trout. Yeah, but, you know, like the shrimp were like, nah, this is, this is what we need. Yeah, because again, I suppose with the fish, you got more to do. Whereas a shrimp, you just kind of, you know, you just kind of float about, really, don't you? <laughs> like, <laughs> you are right, but it just sounds so fucking stupid to say that. <laughs> you know, as uh, as a fish, you've got to get your kids to the school. Um... <laughs> school, get it. <laughs> I've just been Googling, and uh, I don't know, I can't see mouth labelled on the shrimp picture. I mean, did you just Google image search a shrimp and just look for the mouth? <laughs> Because uh, there must be a more scientific explanation. Anatomy of a shrimp. 
And uh, I can tell you that... Uh, At least we found our band name. <laughs> yeah, well, I can tell you that it has a thing on its head called the rostrum. Right. And is that mouth-like? Mm, no. An alternate name for the legs of a uh, shrimp is the periopods. <laughs> I mean, I like the word, that's great. But not what we were after. <laughs> I don't know why I brought this up. What's the difference between prawn and shrimp? The spelling, mostly. <laughs> Prawns have a monarchy, whereas shrimps don't. I don't know. I just Google what's the difference between shrimp and prawn and all the top results are <laughs> go get it. <laughs> adjust that shrimps are on cocaine. <laughs> Which is just what I brought up in the first place. So Google as the sort of unseen editor desperately trying to get us back on topic. <laughs> I mean, it will make uh, Endless Shrimp at Red Lobster more interesting if they're all full of cocaine. Oh yeah, that's the point. If you eat them, are there, if there are traces, trace amounts... Could you get high? Would... Oh, enough to fail a joke. Because if you eat poppies... Not poppies. Like a poppy seed bagel, it is possible to eat enough poppy seed bagel to uh, turn up positive for opioids. Yeah, but I mean, how many poppy seed bagels? I think... No, it was a, no, which... it was a doable amount, because I remember watching something and somebody ate enough and then did the test. It's not like that thing oh. where um, it's like, you know, you can drink enough coffee to kill you, but you have to drink literally like 18,000 litres that you just couldn't possibly ingest. <laughs> yeah, I always go one litre short of that amount yeah. on a daily basis just to get me through. Just in case. Yeah, yeah. Based on your diet, what would your shrimp be uh, infused with? Well, I'm not sure I understand the question. Are you asking what am I peeing into the water stream or? Yes, I mean, I was trying not to say <laughs> that quite so uh, bluntly, but <laughs> what, what would be the standout I'd element of your diet? Possibly Yorkshire tea, sometimes tea, Thai Infused food tea. Infused with Earl Grey. Oh, not Earl Grey. Savage. No? Well, I'd say Savage. Savage. Opposite of Savage. <laughs> Far it's too cultured quite an me. elegant drink. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't particularly like Earl Grey, in no, case you're thinking of sponsoring us. I don't think Earl Grey is a thing. Like, is an entity in itself. Like, he's not still around. <laughs> Whilst we're at it, let's get the Duke of Wellington to give us some boots. <laughs> And the other sandwich to... And King Hot Dog. Dr. Pepper, he's not landed gentry, but he's still a well-known figure in the establishment. That is true. <laughs> so, with our freebasing crustaceans out of the way, what's your first topic, Chris? Aren't they arthropods, not crustaceans? Oh, I don't fucking know. <laughs> <laughs> or by the tone of your voice, care. I mean, I've just Googled the anatomy of a shrimp, but... No, this is your topic. <laughs> I'm not going oh, yeah, that's it. right. I'll start off by asking you, Chris, how truthful is your CV? And obviously, if anyone from your work is listening, 100%. Uh, yes, obviously. It's mostly true, but I obviously... Um, you over some bits of it. Like, for example, we've had a film featured on the Film 4 website. It was a short film, and we basically just uploaded it, and it made it past the initial moderation stage, but... uh I'd rather just say, it's been featured on the Film 4 website. <laughs> Sounds a lot better. Yeah, I think, because that's the thing, especially early on in your career, when you've got limited work experience, it's not necessarily a lie, just sort of exaggerated truths, or sometimes omitted parts of truth. So, for example, on my CV, I had, my writing has appeared in a number of magazines, but that number being one. <laughs> and uh, my, <laughs> Yeah. And my writing has been featured on BuzzFeed, admittedly, on an article called 26 Tumblr Posts You'll Identify With If You Suffer From Depression. <laughs> I thought it was better than what I thought you were going to say. I thought you were going to say, because I left a comment on an article once. <laughs> so that is scraping an even smaller barrel. I used to have a co-winner of 2006 Time Magazine's Person of the Year because it was dedicated to the reader of the magazine. <laughs> And I also had world's strongest man, possibly and emotionally, because I once said no to a second chocolate digestive biscuit, which I think qualifies. Yeah, but I was going to say, that is quite... Uh... <laughs> Apparently the people at world's strongest man beg to differ. <laughs> well, I asked that because this week I read about a psychological effect called McDonald's effect, and that is that there's a trend... If people have on their CV that they've worked at McDonald's, it has a it paints a negative view on someone's CV rather than improves it. Oh, I really thought you were going to say something and then end it with E-I-E-I-O. But anyway, carry on. Different McDonald's. <laughs> if you've worked on McDonald's Farm of Legend, then I imagine that's great work experience. Mm-hmm. But having McDonald's ain't really. Yeah, and it, it's, it seems incredibly it's, harsh. 
Yeah, well, it's clearly bollocks because working in retail is hard and working in fast food retail is even harder because you've got mm-hmm. long hours, dangerous equipment, you're on your feet all day on a hard surface, you're working in hot kitchens with impatient mm-hmm. customers, and you've got to do it all with a smile on your face and in uncomfortable uniforms. Yeah. And it seems weird that we as a society have sort of demanded this service to be 24 hours a day, almost instantly, mm-hmm. cheaply available. And then only to sort of demean the people who f- fulfil that service. Yeah. Well, um, uh, one of our friends, actually, he worked at uh, McDonald's. You remember the London Olympics? They um, mm. they opened up, like, I think it was the biggest McDonald's in the world. But it was only temporarily. Like, literally yeah. just in, like, you know, for just outside the stadium somewhere. So they actually, like, because he's from the northwest of England, and they actually got him and the loads of others like bust them all down to London and put them up in digs just so they could work in this uh, giant McDonald's for a month, and then and then they closed it down and he goes back. <laughs> like that's yeah. literally like being bussed around. Like, and, I mean, he was a manager, but I think mm. or assistant manager or something like that, team leader. One of those. One of those words for having a moderate <laughs> amount of power. <laughs> yeah, when you're earning the small to medium bucks. Yeah, because I think that one, the store was so big that they had tabled waiting service and uh, people on roller skates to get around the the massive I, I, so-called restaurant are, even quicker. Are you sure? Are you no. sure that wasn't just like an eat <laughs> about the 1980s? <laughs> Quite possibly. It might have in, involved more like a milkshake bar from yeah. some American state I've made up. But yeah, I, I swear I remember that. But it could have been one of my usual self-ingested lies. <laughs> But yeah, several studies done in the field of social mobility show that employers of white collar jobs or, you know, sort of office jobs Mm -hmm. view negatively or even outright dismiss candidates that have worked there. And it's such, like you say, it's such a weird, snobbish thing. Yeah, was this study done in America or here? Yeah, they're all American based studies. I was going to say, because America, well, well, from what obviously I'm the. um, the social media half of our duo. Obviously, I spend a lot of time on Twitter and stuff, and you see stuff. Hey, yeah, like very American view when they talk about you know raising the minimum wage and stuff. They always comment saying you know uh, McDonald's isn't a job that you're supposed to be able to survive on. It's supposed to be a stepping stone for high school kids. Uh, you know, a bit of extra money and a stepping stone in your career. People who work there and expect to be able to survive or uh, earn a decent wage or whatever. Uh, being outrageous. That, I mean, that's already like a dickhead thing to say. <laughs> you couple it with, but actually, if you try and use it as a stepping stone, I'm going to look down on you. It's like, <laughs> yeah. It's like, so I don't want you to ever leave that job, but also, if you expect to stay in that job, I don't want you to survive. But also, I demand 24 7 burgers. Yeah, because, you know, the customers have created the demand for that. Then, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I will despise you if you try to make this into your career. It's I've. I, w- I work in retail, and I've on multiple occasions I've had I've been serving people at the till, and maybe like parents come in with their kids, and they've said like to the kids with me mere feet away, said make sure you study hard at school or you'll end up like this guy, and yep. it's like I'm not some cautionary tale for your kids like ambitions. Like I get well, that you are no, a cautionary tale, yeah. <laughs> not, not because of this. Yeah, it's it's not only just study school book, maintain your grasp on reality. <laughs> you know, all right, the the role of customer like service assistant isn't a cautionary tale for for kids who like I get that you know parents want the best for their kids, but I'm I'm a human being. I'm, not to sound like the elephant man, but <laughs> Look, we all have our struggles. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also like, well, you know what? I did study hard at school, and joke's on you, I had a mental breakdown at uni, and that's why I'm here, so <laughs> shove that up you. Okay, I didn't mean to say that. That was <laughs> slightly too confessional, but... Um, Sorry, you know, still uh, what's that... happening in the... So I'm not sure if this is what you're saying to me now, or are you still quoting what happened in the shop? At this point, they're backing away wide-eyed and calling for another member of staff. And I'm just flinging hummus at them, going, I'm fine! Honestly, I'm fine! I've got a podcast, I don't need therapy! What a weird image. <laughs> I don't know why I imagined that you were stood on the, uh, yeah, like on the conveyor belt bit. <laughs> Throwing stuff, Possibly but nude. also keep going back. <laughs> and so you constantly have to readjust yourself and walk a few paces forward. 
And we both know I don't have that kind of flexibility these days. Anywho. Uh, yeah, what were we talking about? <laughs> there is also, when I was researching this, there is a second meaning of the McDonald's effect, which appeared not in respected psychological journals, but on um, uh, Urban Dictionary. And it's mm-hmm. the phenom- phenomenon of, you ask someone, oh, do you want to get food? And they say, no, I'm not hungry. But it, when you buy McDonald's, and they even if they said they're not hungry, they'll, uh, you know, you cannot put hot McDonald's fries in front of someone and them to not eat at least one. That is true. I love this not McDonald's because it's never actually that nice and yet I can't help but love it. Oh fuck, I almost just said the slogan. <laughs> <laughs> Give us some sponsorship money. I was going to say, I probably should have mentioned this before I was about to segue into a <laughs> you know, a, a plea for advertising uh, money, but you went and you know, <laughs> sunk that one by saying, it is always shit and yet I find myself Pavlovianly cramming their disgusting cardboard mulch into my greedy mouth. Exactly. Oh, anyway, sure. now that we've uh, sold capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that what we've done? <laughs> oh, nice one us. <laughs> anyway, McDonald's, give us money. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. It's edible. <laughs> okay, so that's the end of my first topic. Chris, what have you got for your second one? Okay, so um, I assume you're familiar with the phrase, don't judge a book by its cover. I am. Do you think that you can tell what somebody's like just by looking at them? Like, do you ever get like an impress? You know, you see somebody and you think, without being racist, because <laughs> like, this could go down a very like dodgy track very quickly. Um, not that I'm accusing you of being racist. I'm just saying, like, the way I phrase that question in hindsight, I'm like, hold on a second. Uh, I think, but I, I try my best not to. Um, well, you're wrong. Oh. You should. What, be well, racist? Kind of. No, 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 you shouldn't be racist. See, this is what I was saying, like, you have to... <laughs> I realised that we're going to have to be very clear with this one. So a study's been done. You can tell by some by a man's face whether or not he's more likely to cheat on his partner. What if his mouth is opening and closing and the words, I have been cheating on my partner, are coming out <laughs> of it? <laughs> that helps. <laughs> no, apparently men with more masculine faces... Are more likely to seem and also be unfaithful. And what definition of a masculine face are we going off? A prominent jaw? Yeah, strong jaw, thinner lips, a strong brow ridge. So apparently, you know, like if you show people a bunch of faces, you know, you say, you know, which one of these are more likely to cheat? There is a correlation between the ones that you say are more likely and the ones that have cheated on their partners. Although it's, uh, it turns out, it, and it is a, um, it's women to men, whereas men to men don't seem to be able to work out as much. Hmm. Might just be that women are uh, better judges of character. So by that equation, then Clark Kent would be a prime suspect for being a cheater. Yes, but also those magic glasses make him completely unrecognisable. They reckon it might be an evolutionary advantage uh, to women to recognise which guys are more likely to cheat, allowing heterosexual women to spot a flaky partner who... Uh, might leave them raising someone else's child. Oh, you know, leave them raising the child on their own. That's quite spurious, but I didn't. It's not my research. Back in the old, old days, Mm -hmm. then, like, before the sort of social staple of monogamy. Oh, really? We're going way back. Uh, Oh, like, way, way, way way back. So it's just because when we say back in the day, we can mean anything from (laughs) From the 50s. (laughs) All the way to, like, dinosaurs. <laughs> okay, a little bit after the dinosaurs, then. Yeah, well, before 1995. <laughs> yeah, okay, quite a bit before 1995. Like, yeah, way, way before the advent of the tie-dye t-shirt. Are they, are, they, are they saying, like, the sort of leftover characteristics of what we might call alpha men, without any of the sort of mm-hmm. modern bullshit we attach to that phrase, is that yeah. they're more likely just to inseminate multiple partners? It seems so. I mean, I guess, like, what else was there to do back in them days, you know? Hunt and plough. Yeah. And that was before the invention, <laughs> invention of the plough. Invention of the plough, yeah. <laughs> and indeed the ploughman's lunch. About the... <laughs> I was going to say, you just, you just made a joke about, like, the advent of agriculture. I mean, that, <laughs> that was niche. <laughs> <laughs> May I remind you I started by telling a joke in French. <laughs> if we're talking about True. niche. Great, um, um, because <laughs> that seems like yeah. like such a a, a a spurious link to the past. Oh, that, it, that just a that's lot, the thing with a lot of these. A, a defined jaw would 
I mean, if it correlates, yeah, well, it correlates, but it's not causation. Well, that's the thing. So a lot of the time, they correlate stuff, and then you try and think about what. So, yeah, science. Um, <laughs> they sort of, <laughs> you know. That, you, that was a lazy yeah, explanation a... even for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, me explain. so yeah, so they'll do a study and they'll find a correlation between, you yeah. know, in this case, bases and cheating or whatever. But then they try and think of the evolutionary advantages it may have done. So it's sort of a two-part study. Mm. This is what we found. This is a potential reason for it. I see. Because obviously you can't really be that certain about a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like when the blood drains from your face and stuff... Um, you know, when you're shot, like in a state of shock or whatever, and it's like, is, you know, we know that happens when you're shocked. Evolution advantage, more blood to go to, like, your legs or whatever. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe that helps you, but they don't know. Yeah. Or like that sensation when you're falling asleep and you suddenly sort of like jerk as though you're falling, even though, oh, you yeah. know, you're just in oh, bed. Yeah. And yeah. like, the theory is, it's like a psychological. Uh, hangover from from sleeping in trees. Oh, really? I think, and I think there's there a fun, there fancy word like a a somniatic jerk or something. Wow! Either that or it's a it's a an obscure I mean, that sounds like something else. Yeah, an ab- obscure event in the Olympics, maybe. <laughs> or sleep wanking. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, um, the Victorians taught this whole uh, being able to tell what somebody's characters like by how they look very seriously and again not just racism because back in those days the police uh, you know they thought criminals had a certain look about them so um, they called it physiognomy mm-hmm. might be a silent G or something might be like gnome physiognomy don't know that's the study um, of gnome faces though <laughs> yeah but apparently you could tell a person's character or personality from that outer appearance so things such as having a deceitful looking chin. <laughs> um, there's a thing here, so it's from a book called Vox, pra- Vox Practical Character Reader. And it's got a picture of somebody with like a very tight lipped mouth. It says, Deceitful mouth. One with this mouth can be very agreeable and yet still have a selfish axe to grind. <laughs> I mean, that's there's a picture of a guy with like a big forehead and it's like a deceitful head. Clearly remember this shape and apply it. <laughs> I mean, that's reading quite a lot into a mouth. He could have just, I don't know, eaten a lemon. Mm-hmm. Apparently, if you have a uh, a woman with a weird, like a skull that sort of goes in a bit at the back, is an unreliable mother. Are you good to your like... kids? Let's shave the back of her head first and find out. <laughs> it's just like all these things, you know, and there's like stuff like, you know, if you had like a boil or something, be like, oh, well, you'll probably, uh, you could probably uh, ne'er do well. Yeah, because it's the sin appearing in a pustule upon the very skin. Exactly. Well, I know Margaret Thatcher didn't, not that I like to quote Margaret Thatcher <laughs> too often or at all, <laughs> but she didn't trust uh, men with beards because she described the chin as the window to the soul. That is very weird. <laughs> yeah, and the only, the least weird thing about her. Yeah. And the fear of beards oh. is called pagonophobia. Is that true? Yeah. How, why, why do you know that? <laughs> like, why does anyone know anything? Because we do. <laughs> Science. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know how to answer that question. Anyway, Chris, what's your topic that we'll talk about for ten seconds and then ignore? Oh, ye little faith! I have at least twelve seconds of content prepared. But I'll start off by asking you a question, as always, Chris. What are the key components needed to host an amazing party? I'd say friends, and I've never had that ingredient. So after that, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> I'm a little bit hurt because I remember our wild and decadent parties from our adolescence, oh, yeah, that's true. which included an array of dips, numerous flavours of Doritos, not a sponsor, just a big fan, yeah. uh, antiquated soft drinks like dandelion and burdock, oh, yeah. subsequent amazement at how good antiquated soft beverages like dandelion and burdock are. It really is an underrated decent... beverage. <laughs> it's so good. We had it the other week. I, <laughs> I was there. <laughs> I know. That's why I said we. I included him in the pronoun. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> so by all accounts, if you'd been throwing a party in the mid 1700s, it would have been absolutely awful because it was lacking one very important thing pineapples. Good. What? <laughs> yeah, I am going to explain that, not going, <laughs> that's all this week. 
Because pineapples were once a status symbol of wealth and luxury that were brought from native South America by Columbus and uh, failed to grow in Europe because they lack the tropical climate. But by the mid-1600s, they were grown in hot houses in England, which were like greenhouses, but, you know, sort of artificially heated. And uh, they were so expensive, they were only available for the super rich. Uh, Charles II even commissioned a painting of his gardener uh, presenting him with a pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see that, that painting now. <laughs> just like... Because it's so... Um, like, obviously... <laughs> back, I know, it's just like, obviously, it's a sign how the world's changed. Because now, like, it's just mundane. Like, you just go to a supermarket. Like, there's just nothing, like, mysterious about Yeah, it's about like it. in a fruit salad. But, yeah, like... You know, yeah, we have it in cans now. We Like, it's just <laughs> available. Like, <laughs> you know, it's just... Yeah, do you want it in chunks of, or slices? <laughs> yeah, just the reverence of... Here's a weird spiky fruit. <laughs> well, it's like that, you know, that thing about how, like, for all the, the the wealth and power of like sort of medieval monarchs, they'd have to commission like a fleet to go and get spices needed mm. for a curry yeah. that can be readily found it like found in any local supermarket or, with a choice of four different curries. It's just great. Like, obviously, it's just the nature of globalization, yeah. <laughs> and you know, it there's um. Well, definitely coming at a price. But the richest person in the world in, like, the 1500s or whatever had a worse standard of life than, like, the average Western European or American or whatever. Yeah, like, you didn't have ready access to salt, but you still somehow had gout. Yes. (laughs) And you had to live in a castle that was probably freezing and, like, mouldering all the time. That's it. They had, like, obscene wealth and, like, there were some things they could do with it, like... You know, they never had to work, you know, you had servants and everything, you had all this pain. But yeah, like you say, still massively susceptible to, like, dying from dysentery or whatever. Like you say, still lived in a freezing cold castle. And at no point owned a jet ski. Yeah, exactly. I mean, neither have I, but still, take that, Charles II. No. <laughs> well, yeah, who's really winning? But I mean, like, you could probably afford, like, an experience day with a jet ski. True. In a way that he... Definitely couldn't and didn't. That we know of. <laughs> Maybe he's never got a painting. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to see that painting. His, his gardener on a subsequent, you know, another jet ski presenting with a pineapple <laughs> and a speech bubble saying, we're on fucking jet skis. <laughs> they don't have speech bubbles much in <laughs> painting. I was say, like, like, have you ever been to an art gallery of, like, you know... <laughs> You know, gone to the Louvre and just like Mona Lisa with a speech bubble yeah. saying, I'm so enigmatic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprisingly small. <laughs> it's true, actually. I mean, yeah. I, went, I went there. And, it's it's uh, full of amazing stuff and everyone goes straight to that. And there's a massive crowd around it. Yeah, I didn't even like, bother trying eh. to get near it. I just took a picture of the crowd and went like, huh, how many people have tried to get there? Because it just wasn't worth trying to fight to the front. Yeah, we can definitely like just Google image it, yeah, and it's exactly. you can see it. It's probably roughly the same size <laughs> yeah. as well. Exactly. So to get us slightly back on topic, just a um, bit. by the 18th century, the rich in uh, American colonies were importing pineapples from the Caribbean, and in today's money, they went for up to eight thousand dollars. So that's a lot. <laughs> 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 Science slash economics. Yeah, it's a little bit more than uh, two pound fifty, whatever it is in Tesco's. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, you can get a tin of them for like, you know, eighty five p. I thought you were going to say a tin um, of them for eight grand. That was like, I don't believe you. can, but the tin's got to be made out of <laughs> adamantium. Um, <laughs> and... Not stopping you from ever opening it in the world's worst yeah. purchase. Wolverine, can I have another favour? Is it to get new pineapples? <laughs> Yes, please. <laughs> okay, but this is the last time. Uh, dear Cooking with Grief, I listened to your most recent episode and you incorrectly stated that Wolverine could cut through adamantium. I don't know. Is that a, th- a thing? That, anyway. Yeah, well, okay. his, his claws are covered in adamantium, but I'm not sure whether or not adamantium can cut adamantium. Is it like diamond cutting diamond? Yeah. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Um, pineapples <laughs> were shown... <laughs> so I was going to say, as just mostly, this is out of our knowledge base. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and filed under all things. Yeah, there were set up, pineapples were used as centerpieces at parties to show off your opulence and wealth, and this uh, habit of showcasing them trickled down to the, 
I guess you call them middle classes, although I don't know if the middle class existed then. And you could actually rent pineapples for parties, you know, to show off to your friends like, oh, look at us, we're doing so well, we've rented a pineapple to have on our mantelpiece. <laughs> I look forward to uh, to not eating this. <laughs> like, what, yeah, like, what you next? Look, yeah, here's a picture of a horse that we've never owned. <laughs> And the rarity and um, uh, like extreme extravagance of the pineapple continued until 1900, when industrialist uh, James Dole, who went on to make the Dole Food Company, which I believe is a thing, um, started a plantation okay. in... <laughs> <laughs> well, like, I- I'm sure Americans will recognise the name Dole Food, okay. food Company, apparently. It's, it's, but as, you know... As humble Englishmen as we are, Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean anything to me. Okay. He started a plantation in Hawaii and went on to produce 75% of the world's pineapples, making them uh, sort of easily shippable and as plentiful as we enjoy today. There you go. And thus ended the lesson, the humble history, well, I suppose not humble, the extravagant (laughs) history (laughs) of the pineapple. Yes. And all it took to uh, take it from... Decadence was a guy opening a plantation with all the horrific connotations <laughs> that implies. Yeah, you know, it wasn't uh, it wasn't good working conditions. Well, uh, cheap pineapples. So, well, <laughs> just imagine how good would you be if you had a pineapple renting company, and then this guy comes along, like your entire business model overnight is just gone. I don't know about overnight, but yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> about yeah, over but... several nights. Over a season. <laughs> a season, yeah. A rough approximation of three months. <laughs> You'd see your, your business not fall off a cliff, just dwindle. <laughs> so what... Sorry, it's, just, it's just... We have no idea how long it takes to grow a pineapple. We're speculating here wildly. <laughs> what is the growing period of a pineapple? <laughs> it's a lot harvest. of homework for this. <laughs> <laughs> do, do shrimp have mouths? Um, and how long does a pineapple take to gestate? Yeah, uh, that's not the right word. Not gestate. It's not. It's not birth from a, a fruity womb. And if our band band name of a the anatomy of a prawn doesn't take off, then fruity womb might. <laughs> sounds like the worst. That sounds like the worst. Um, like the worst thing ever. <laughs> Cubs and Starburst are so ran out by doing some food to wound. <laughs> yeah, if some guy waddled up to it, I don't know why I waddled, he comes up to it at a party. He's, <laughs> he's a penguin in the sort of guys, but that's not, that's not important. Okay, some guy saunters up to a party and offers you a bag and says, Fruity <laughs> Wound. Just walk. Like, why is he going to saunter? <laughs> Look, he's got orthopedic shoes, but that's not part of his. That's not the main thing of his story. Uh, he sashays up to you in a, <laughs> and offers you a fruity womb. <laughs> I think I'd rather have a lamp fancy. Like masturbating to a 1974 album by Nico, we've come to the end. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> carry on. Thank you. This has been episode 29 of Cooking with Grief, and it just leaves us to say thank you for listening, and we'll hope you'll join us again next time. I've been Chris. I have also been Chris. I assume that pause was my cue. It was, so thank you for (laughs) filling the the silence so (laughs) efficiently in a way that I now, the longer we talk about it, I now can't edit out. (laughs) So thank you for listening, and may you rise above the storms of being and walk like thunder. Bye! And check us out on Twitter and uh, subscribe. <laughs> uh, cooking with Grief with no G. No, no G on cooking. We do leave it on Grief. Yeah, we're, we're not called <laughs> Cooking with Reef. Who is this elusive Reef? And how good is he at making a paella? Yes, yeah, so let's. Uh, that you were almost so slick, and then I derailed it. I, I wrote it out. I had a, you know, a, a, I was going to say a nice joke. Then it wasn't a nice joke, to be honest, but it was a joke at least. It was a joke. It existed. Yeah, it, it was a thing. I said it. We recorded it. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Cooking with Grief. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to recommend it to a friend. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email cookingwithgrief at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter. That's at cookingwithgrief. 
If you'd like to hear more episodes, then please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you've got the time, then it'd be great if you could leave us a review on iTunes. Thank you. I'm Dave Lewis, a massive Liverpool supporter. And I'm Eric Neal, Newcastle United, Toon Toon, Black and White Army. We're the hosts of Two Rash Challenges, a weekly podcast about the English Premier League, Champions League, MLS, the men's national team, and whatever else strikes our fancy in the world of football. Look for us on iTunes and Transistor and check us out on Twitter at Rash underscore podcast. Hey, it's the podcast nobody asked for.